What's going on, guys? I am Pat the Pac-Man. Welcome to another episode of Barking for Balance, the podcast where we talk about dogs or we talk about whatever it is that we want to talk about. Today, I want to touch up on a little bit about rescuing a dog compared to buying a dog uh, from a either a breeder or a pet store or uh, something along those lines, whether rescuing a dog or buying a dog. I also want to touch up on and talk about a topic that's very, very important to me. And it's very, very important in general. And the topic is basically that out of chaos comes great opportunity. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And I also want to go over a little bit about the concept of not having any time. You know, I fall trapped to that as well. Not I have no time to do what it is that needs to get done. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's get started a little bit about, about dogs. And um, obviously we're going to start with dogs. I'm going to mix it up every once in a while. So Sometimes we're going to talk about dogs, sometimes we're going to talk about something else. But in this case, I want to get this uh, out in the open and talk a little bit about rescuing a dog compared to like buying a dog and where the difference lies. So I know that a lot of the rescue people and the shelter people are going to be completely against buying a dog altogether. And I totally get that. Um, I have mixed mixed feelings on the matter. Um so let's 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 discuss that a little bit so we could you know we could we could share our opinions and um and see you know what's what's the appropriate answer and i don't really think that there is an appropriate answer um i think the the reality of it it, it boils down to just being knowledgeable dog owners and um and and proper dog owners i think that's really the key to this whole thing whether it's rescuing a dog or buying a dog it really at the end of the day i don't really think it makes a difference unless you know you're going through the wrong place so let's go over this a little bit so why rescue a dog compared to why buying a dog? Well, the theory behind it is that there's a lot of dogs that are, you know, um, you know, in shelters and rescue and rescues, you know, they're homeless, whatever the case may be. And a lot of them come from, from difficult situations. You know, some come from overseas, uh, Mexico and Puerto Rico and Egypt and other areas. Um, and some dogs are here in the United States and they come from hoarding situations or just abusive situations or whatever the case may be. Um, so they end up in like the shelters, they end up in the rescues and those kind of things. And the rescues most of the time have fosters. So they end up in a family environment, in a home environment. So why get a rescue compared to buying a dog? Well, most of the time, what ends up happening, at least from my experience, and uh, my experience has been that people that end up buying a dog, it's a mixture of why they're doing it. There's no, there's no right or wrong answer as to why they do it. Although some people do do that for the wrong reason. So let's go over um, buying a dog and that kind of good stuff. And, you know, I have, I have limited experience and exposure when it comes to dogs. I mean, I've had three dogs my entire life, uh, two of them that are current. And my first dog, which was peanut, my, my Shih Tzu poodle um, that I bought when, when uh, I actually, yeah, I, I bought him uh, from a pet store. Um, that was in 2000, around 2003. You know, I, I really wasn't knowledgeable in that, um, in that regard. I didn't know any better um, about pet stores. So, you know, that's just what it, what it was, you know, if, as far as I was concerned is you just, you know, you, you buy a dog, you know, um, I mean, I'm embarrassed to admit it now, but at the time I really didn't care about, about dogs. It was, it was a dog is like a doll or whatever, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm buying a dog, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I didn't know any better. And obviously there wasn't as much, uh, as much literature and as much, as much uh, education and knowledge as, as there is now available, you know, through the internet and all that kind of good stuff. So, you know, ignorance was, was the key there, but regardless of the fact, you know, buying a dog from a pet store, and this is my personal opinion, and it seems to be pretty much a fact. I mean, based on what's going on, um, although people still, still do it, you know, I'm not sure why that's the case with everything that we know and everything that we've experienced and everything that others have experienced. I'm not sure why me personally, that will never happen again. And the reason why I'm saying that is because yes, a peanut was amazing. He was amazing. You know, he was a 15 pound. He was a love bug and a half. Now, as I mentioned before, you know, not having any experience with dogs, not having any knowledge of dogs, I did everything wrong when it came to peanut and he still turned out 99% perfect um, because he was just that kind of, he was predisposed for that kind of, um, for that kind of, of, of life. That's, that's just who he was, you know, and that's the people that, you know, like we talk about when it comes to like the three personalities of dogs, which I'll get to another time, but he's, he's in that personality category where he makes people think like they're the dog whisperer because he turns out perfect. And it's got nothing to do with what you did. Like I said, I did everything wrong, you know? So, he just turned out to be perfect. 99% of him was perfect. And 
um, like I said, I bought from a pet store. So from my experience now and for what, what I've, I've, I've been told and what I've researched, um, it seems that there's two, two potential issues. And from my ex current experience, this is what it seems like now, now that I'm in the world of dogs, that there's two possible things that happen when it comes to, to, to a buying a dog from a, from a pet store. And we're going to get to that in a second as to why that is. But it's either psychological slash behavioral consequences slash behavioral issues or uh, physical issues. Now, in my particular case, uh, like I said, I got lucky when it came to Peanut. He was perfect from a personality standpoint. However, uh, from the physical standpoint, he, he wasn't. Um, he ended up passing away, um, I believe, at the age of 10. Um, he had Addison's uh, for a few years. I mean, you know, he didn't last. I mean, for, for a 15, 15 pound dog to pass away at the age of 10, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, wasn't the greatest. Um, I'm gonna have a hard time talking about Peanut, so I want to discuss him on a separate day because I'm gonna get really emotional. You're gonna see me cry quite a bit on that one. But um, you know, when it comes to Peanut, like I said, he, you know, he, his, the physical uh, stuff is really where where things went went wrong with him. From a from a behavioral, it wasn't an issue. Physically, yeah, and that's really what it seems like when it comes to pet store dogs. And the reason why is because most of the time they come from what we call a puppy mill. And a puppy mill is basically just a ground for, for making money. You know, um, they have, they have a mom and a dad, they just churn puppies constantly. And there's a lot of stuff that's involved with that. I don't want to get too technical with the whole thing there, but the bottom line is that having also been in the, in, in, in the midst of rehabilitating dogs that were um, in puppy mills, they were the studs. Uh, one, one was a Yorkie male and the other one was a female a Doberman. Uh, and there was a few others, but those were like the two most messed up dogs because they lived in a puppy mill their whole life. And then by the time they got to a certain age, they were not you know, useful to them anymore. So they just gave them away. But the, the, the psychological consequences were just, you know, they were there and they were difficult to rehabilitate. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's heartbreaking to see what happens to them. And then the puppies kind of like are raised in an environment, uh, not raised, but you know, like they come out after, 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 you know, two months, uh, eight weeks before they go to uh, the pet stores. And we're hoping that that's the case. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if these, these puppies leave earlier and um, you know, they're raised in a cage and they leave earlier. They're I mean, it, it's just, it's just, it's just a shit show. So do the puppies grow uh, properly? it's 50 50 it's yes or no you know um from the behavioral side and or the physical side and you know it, it, it's tough because you know you're buying these dogs thinking that they're coming from like a reputable breeder and they come with these papers and all these certificates and you know to be honest the paper you can wipe your ass with it that you buy with these papers um you know they're they're useless you know they're they're just they're, they don't mean anything you know but they they they're sold and they have this image and you walk into the store and they're behind the glass doors oh guess up what are you doing you guess you're so cute and and then you you know you fall in love and what are you gonna do you know what i'm saying so that's really what ends up happening you know they're, they're in locations in the mall or whatever and you fall in love so you know, my personal opinion on it is, is stay away from the, the pet stores. You know, the less people buy from pet stores, the less pet stores are going to be, which means they're going to start shutting down some of these puppy mills, or we could start to, you know, get rid of some of these puppy mills. Cause it's just, like I said, it's heartbreaking to see what goes on with the parents. Um, you know, the, the, the way they become is just shocking. And I would love to have as special guests, um, the two people in particular that I was talking about as to describe what their life was like and how, you know, their dogs were that both of those dogs have since passed, but, um, you know, I would love for them to, to, to share with you what, what their, what their life with them was and, and how things were. So you get a feel for it. I think it would be really great. But, um, like I said, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking to see how they are. And like, you know, the whole point of it is just, churning out puppies because once that cage in the pet store is open and it's in the puppy's gone, guess what? Another one's going to come right back right inside. And so it's key. It's a constant flow. So that's why those puppy mills, they want that. They love that churning mechanism because you get rid of one bram, bam, bring in another one. And so they continue that process and it's just, it's just awful. So that's my personal two cents on, on the pet stores. Stay away from them. It's not necessary. Now, when it comes to breeders and um, rescuing, is there a difference? Yes. Now, the biggest difference is most people have buy a dog from a breeder for two reasons. Number one is 
see with this 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 new thing with these these designer dogs with these like mixed blend of dogs this has become a really really big big problem when it comes to the dog world you know when i got peanut uh he was a shih tzu poodle and again he was in a pet store so that's when you know, this whole mixed thing started to come around and it started to become like a fad. And unfortunately in America, that's really what, what hooks everybody here is, is a fad. It's what's in style, what's cool. And that started to become it, you know, but at the time they were, they were called mutts. They were called rescue dogs. Like you would find them in the shelter, mixed breeds. And, you know, that's really what was going on, but now you pay a fortune for them. And, you know, from when I purchased Peanut in in two thousand and three to now, the, the 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 pricing is is skyrocketed. Not to mention that this business of mixed breeds is just gone crazy, you know. So that's a whole other thing, and I mean we could discuss that separately, but um, that's that's created a lot of things because at the time, the reason why I'm saying that's a whole other topic that kind of like has thrown a monkey wrench in this is is because at the time rescue dogs used to be mixed breeds. They used to be mutts, you know, and then there was purebred. So it was like 50, 50, you want a mixed breed, you rescue or get, or get you know, rescue from a shelter or, or a breeder. You want a purebred, you get it from a breeder. That was the problem. But now you have purebred labradoodles and purebred golden doodles and purebred cavapoos and all this other shit. They mix this one with that one. It's just, it's just, El minestrone, El minestrone. It's just crazy. So um, they've thrown a monkey wrench into this whole thing. But let's just stay on topic. We could talk about that in a separate podcast. Um, the whole thing with these, with the, with the rescuing concept, is the fact that they're coming from. They used to come from like troubling situations. You know, people give up their dogs; they can't handle them. You know, people pass away. You know, financial reasons. You know, people give up their dogs for ridiculously stupid reasons. But regardless of the fact. Um, and then there's there's now this this mixed situation. So it, it kind of makes things really complicated. So do, what do you do? Do you cho- do you buy a dog from a breeder or do you, you do you rescue a dog? It's not it's hard to say. I mean, I know for the rescue and the shelter people say, well, you got it. There's so many dogs out there. And I agree with that, that that would be that should be your first choice. But what if you want a specific type of dog? Now, there are rescues that do cater to specific breeds, you know, but do you find the exact age that you're looking for? I mean, I know that that this is a silly when you're talking to like certain rescues and shelters where, you know, you can't find the age. You know, that's a personal decision. If somebody wants a puppy as opposed to an older dog, that's their decision. If somebody wants this type of dog versus that type of dog, that's their decision. You know what I mean? So I don't really fault anybody for going to a breeder. Um, it's more like a personal decision. You know, my two dogs now are rescues, you know, socks was rescued from a shelter, a big shelter and, uh, pepper came from, from, a, from a rescue, you know, I got pepper as a puppy, you know? And so at that point, like my mind was settled on going for a, a, a rescue dog. Like that's what I wanted. And they're both mixed, you know, they're not, they're not pure, and that's cool. And is there a benefit to, to pure to pure versus mixed? Sure. You know, again, going back to this whole mixture of these designer dogs. It's more just a style thing. It, it, that's what it seems like. It seems like it's just become like a fad. Um, and, and, you know, people are paying a fortune for these mixed dogs. And the health issues are different because now it's pure bread that's it's it's a mixed breed i mean i don't know how you could say that it's a pure bred when it's mixed it's two different breeds put together i mean what are we like so what are we science i don't know listen this again this is a whole other topic we should discuss this separately um we should bring some of my rescue people in on this to to to, to get their opinions on it but you know rescue versus versus purchasing the best thing i could say is when you rescue a dog, you're rescuing them from a potential bad situation. But then the part of the question that I get to is, yeah, but what if I'm getting a puppy? A puppy was rescued from wherever, from Alabama, from Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, whatever. They, they're here. They're in a foster situation. They're not in danger anymore. So how am I rescuing them? And that's legitimate. So people want what they want. You know, they'll fall in love with whatever they fall in love with. And whatever the mentality is, is the mentality. So 
I personally am not trying to make anybody's mind up as to which direction they should go. You know, unfortunately, yes, there are a lot of rescues out there. If we stop buying from breeders, there'll be more adoptions. The problem is that even those mixed breeds in other areas are still going to produce puppies. So the cycling of it is never going to end, you know? So is that really the problem? I don't think so. I think the problem is education. The problem is make sure that your dogs are spayed and neutered. Make sure that you're, you're, you're educating yourself on what these dogs require in order to be happy, fulfilled, and well-behaved. And you could keep them in your goddamn house and not give them away, you know? It just pisses me off the people that don't do what's necessary. And now you got to give your, your dog up. Well, that's on you. It's got, it's not a dog issue. It's a human issue. That's why, you know, it's about training people, not training dogs, you know? So, um, it, it, it's that simple rescuing a dog, buying a dog. The one thing that I could say from a, from a breeder perspective. Okay. I've encountered a, a, quite a few situations where people have purchased dogs from breeders, reputable breeders, which is bullshit. So no, I have one client who bought a dog uh, from a breeder that had bred this particular breed the first time because they were breeding pit bulls, believe it or not. Yeah. But breeding pit bulls before, and then they realized that if they start breeding this particular breed, they could make like 10 times more money, which is what they did. And unfortunately, now they're dealing with the dog that has some massive behavioral issues because th these people don't know what the hell they're doing. Did they do it for the money? So they're, they're, they're don't, there's no clue, they have no clue as to what they're supposed to do. And unfortunately, then other people say, oh, shit, you can make that much money. Fine. I'm going to keep my puppy. I'm not going to spay and neuter him. I'm going to hook him up with another one and start this whole shit. And now we have like this flow of, of puppies that are purebred, but it just, it, 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 they're, they're, they're physically, you know, they're physical issues. I have another client, same exact breed and their dog came, same situation, a backyard breeder, just some, some clown who was a reputable breeder. This one said so. And I thought, so I talked to this one. And then this one said this, and all this shit. And guess what? This dog has physical problems, has cost these people so much money and God bless their soul. They're keeping this dog. They are not getting rid of this dog. They are fighting for this dog and the expense that this dog has put them through. Now they're working with me from a behavioral standpoint, but the, the, the medical bills, oh my Lord. And just like the, the lifestyle of dealing with him, it's heartbreaking. So I commend these people for dealing with it, but not everybody would. And who do I blame? I blame the stupid breeder, you know? And it goes back to that. So are there reputable breeders out there? Yes. However, you need to do your research very, 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 very carefully do your research as to what a reputable breeder is. Just because they've had dogs doesn't mean anything. You want to meet the parents. You want to meet the father. You want to meet the mother. You want to see their living environment. You want to see where they were, they were conceived. Okay. You want to see everything and not just get a dog, a puppy without knowing anything. You want to talk to them and find out how they're raising their dogs. You know what I'm saying? You want to find out what their philosophy is, what their approach is. Because listen, you know, if you want a, like, for, like I'll give you a perfect example. My, the, first, the, one of the, the one dog that helped me overcome my fear of dogs was a bull mastiff. It's not a very common breed, you know? And uh, I would love at one point in my life to have a bull mastiff for that reason, you know? And so- you know, is it, am I going to be able to find one that's a rescue? I want him as a puppy. I want to raise him with my approach and with everything. Am I going to be able to have that? I don't know. Will I end up going to a breeder to get that? I don't know. And so it's possible. But before I do that, you bet your ass that, that I'm going to be doing that. I'm not going to go buy it to just jackass across the street because he says that he could breed them. No, I want a dog that is coming from an environment that's that's stable, that's appropriate, because I want I don't want to perpetuate the shike, the cycle of merda, the cycle of shit. I want to take a dog that is coming from a line of from a person that is protecting that line and is not doing it from the money. Do those people exist? I don't know. Only money counts. So it's a tough situation and people don't really care, including the breeders. They don't really care about the quality of the dogs anymore. Are there certain that do? I'm sure there are. So you just got to do your research, you know, and, and find out where they, where they are. But, you know, as far as like rescuing versus breeding, 
no no pet stores, no pet stores. Number two is don't buy from stupid breeders that you don't know for a fact. You know what I mean? If you get stuck, I understand that's going to happen. You know, now there's a litter, you feel bad. You know, it, it, it's tough. This is it. This whole world is so emotional when it comes to that aspect of things. That's why I commend the people that are involved in rescue because how they do it is beyond me. You know, like you need a strong, strong personality to be in rescue, man, to see the kind of shit that these people see, to put up with the kind of shit that they that they put up with um, and to do what they do. God bless their souls. Um, you know, like I said, to me personally, I feel that the number one priority is education. And I feel that the two most important topics is educating on spaying and neutering. I mean, it's hard to do that because when you have like, you know, there's this involved. And also when you have those people that just have a, a, pre, a preconceived notion of what that means, you know, just like, gay ball, gone. like you cut off the dog's balls and all of a sudden the dog is different. They just don't get it. And, may, and some people will get it eventually, but you have to be patient. You have to educate. And then the other aspect is, is the behavioral aspect of it. The, the, the teaching people what dogs require, what they need in order for them not to be going back to a shelter or a rescue or to be put down or whatever the case may be and to prevent the behavioral issues from, you know, from taking place. So rescuing or breed or, or, you know, getting a rescue or going to a breeder. I really don't have a preference or an opinion either way because of the fact that, you know, people are going to do whatever it is that they're going to do. I mean, I've, I, I, I've had people, and I find this hard to imagine because yes, yeah, some rescues and some shelters are really, really strict with certain things, but not all of them. So if you truly are looking to get a rescue, if you truly want to rescue a dog, You'll find the way if you just go the, the breeding route is because you're lazy ass. That's really what ends up. Oh, you just don't give a shit. You know, you're just going to get a dog, get, get a dog and whatever. I don't really care. You know, so no, you, you know, you don't care about dogs. You don't care about the dog. You just you just want a dog, you know. So that's 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 the bottom line. Uh, and again, that's just my personal opinion on it. Uh, if you guys want to talk about this further, get some some other opinions on it and, you know, teach me, educate me a little bit more. But this I, I, I truly feel that there's really nothing much to do there. It's just more of a, of a preference there on, on, on circumstances, you know. But if you do get a, a breed, if you want to get a breeder or get a dog from a breeder, it has to be a good breeder. It has to be somebody that cares about the dogs and not just the money or not the money, period. OK, that's all. Basta. Basta. Ah, oh, that's a sensitive topic. It's a difficult topic to talk about, but, you know, I feel that we have to because education is key. Education is key when it comes to this whole, this whole situation here, you know, and um, I want to talk about a little bit about, about out of chaos comes great opportunity, which again is, is a topic that's very important to me. And I really don't have, I was trying to figure out like how to segue into that and try to like, you know, transition into that, but I wasn't successful at it. So let's just jump right in. Uh, because again, it's, it, that whole topic is very emotional based on the fact that I have seen and witnessed those dogs that live in puppy mills and, and, and people that do certain things because it's cool and, and the dog is what, what pays the price. So anyway, um, we could discuss this further. If you guys like any questions, you know, hit me up and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit more in, in detail, but at a chaos crumbs, great opportunity. What the hell does that mean? Well, it's a, uh, it's it's an it's an, it's an interesting concept, and what the way I discovered this concept was after I got divorced uh, in two thousand and one. I was a little I was a little down, you know. I was a little depressed because it was a failure. We'll discuss this failure concept at another time, but um, I was a little I was a little down on myself because of this failure, and so my my boss, who's a very good friend of mine now, his name is Eric. He, um, he was my boss at the time. And again, he's a good friend of mine now. He's actually my business consultant. I talked to him about like my business stuff. He's my, my business advisor. And uh, he's always blunt. You know, he just tells me like it is. He doesn't sugarcoat shit. He just says, you know, tells me what it is. And that's the kind of people you want in your life. You don't want the people that are going to like wipe your ass. At that, that's actually going, oh, no, you want honest and direct and tell you how it is anyway. And he's a, he's a, he's a business, a man and a half. He's super successful. So yeah, he, you know, his opinion matters. Um, I don't necessarily follow everything he says, but his opinion definitely matters quite a bit, but anyway, I digress. So during this period, I was a little depressed, unsure, you know, clueless, you know, floundering around trying to figure out what I wanted with my life. He said to me this phrase, and he said that out of chaos comes great opportunity. And throughout my life, a lot of that applies now and has applied throughout that time period. So what that means is that during times that are chaotic, 
we have to find opportunities that are, uh, or we have to create opportunities that help us grow, improve, and change, and adapt. So, like for example, when we're talking about this situation that we're in right now during this pandemic, during this coronavirus or COVID-19 or whatever the hell you want to call it. This person comes, calls it like this. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. The COVID. So the, the COVID is, or it's, 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 it's a tough time. So there's a lot of businesses that are suffering, a lot of people that are suffering and it, it's, it's a sucky time, you know? And when this whole thing started, um, I was one of those that was stuck in the middle of this mess, you know, trying to figure out like what to do. I mean, my whole job was going to people's houses and, and working with them in person with their dogs. So obviously when this whole thing happened, it was like, shit, I got to got fodder. My man had a panic I should I'm going to eat like bread with onions. That's actually a Sicilian saying is like, you know, poor people used to eat bread with onions. I don't know if they actually did that, but that was the saying you eat bread with onions. Anyway, so or an onion sandwich, it's the Americanized version. So I, I really didn't know what, what, what to do. And so there was a lot of projects that I really wanted to put together and I really wanted to get done. And again, out of chaos comes great opportunity. So this was actually the stepping stone that forced me to kind of like start doing some of these projects, this being one of them. Um, it was a lot of information, a lot of, of, of stuff that I wanted to share. I want to be able to, my, my dream, my passion is to teach, inspire, and entertain. That's what I love. That's what God made me. And you know, sharing dog stuff is important, super important, but being inspirational is even more important to me because that's the driving force that's going to keep you going. So when we're talking about like out of chaos comes great opportunity, I had to adapt and grow in this environment that was different, you know? So now I'm not very technologically savvy. So I had to learn, you know, I had to learn to do virtual sessions and what I realized was that because of my approach and because of what I do, which is teaching people, um, the virtual program was actually just as efficient, if not more efficient, and also a fraction of the cost. So it still was able to give people the help that they needed from a distance. And it's been working beautifully to the point that now we're doing more of that purposely because of the fact that it's helping people in what they need, along with not costing as much as, as it normally would. So it's, it's a blessing, you know, because my job is really is not to train dogs, it's to train people. So I can convey that any which way. And if there's any like techniques or, or exercises, we have pre-recorded videos that we do. We have clients recording themselves in a situation that we go over them. And then we have, I have my own personal dogs here that I would demonstrate techniques or exercises. Uh, and then I would, you know, watch how the people were doing. And then if, if, if in person was necessary, we could cater it to that at that point. But it was so weird because I was so uncomfortable. I had to have one of my rescue people, Jen, help me put this, this virtual program together because I had no idea how to work it. We had like a separate session where she's like teaching me how to do this stuff. And I'm like a, like a 90 year old man when it comes to technology. I'm like, yeah, I got big degree. Well, not really. My, my hair isn't gray, but um, I, I had no idea, but I had to do it. It was, I had no choice. This was the only platform that I could use. So then I started to also put together the team of people that could take over the areas that I was weak in. It's important to understand that you know what you don't know, okay? You have to admit to yourself what you don't know. It's important. I know what I know, but I also know what I don't know. Yo sacho. Il cervello funziona. But the stuff that I don't know, can I learn it? Sure. But why when there's somebody else that knows it and that's, that's the, it's their thing? You know, so I started putting a team together of people that could help me in the areas that I needed help with to be able to convey the message, to share the message with them. So in this period of, of chaos, could I just have collapsed like a lot of people have done, continue to do what they were doing, just pray to hope for the best? Sure. But hope doesn't help. Faith. Faith helps. So faith, which I've always I always have said to me, God said to me, you know what? You're going to get through this. We're going to be okay. I'm right by you. I'm right next to you. I got you. We're going to get through this. Just relax. But we need to do certain, certain things. You can't just sit there and just twiddle your thumbs and say, all right, we'll see what happens. Let's just hope for the best. That bullshit doesn't work. You know, we'll figure it out. Like I, that pisses me off when people say that, well, we'll figure it out. Well, we'll see what happens. Well, we'll hope. Let's hope for the best. What the fuck? We'll hope for the best. No, you got to make the best happen. 
You know, you got to make things happen. And the only way to do that is to have faith that, yes, you're going to get through this difficult period, but you got to make changes, make adjustments, improve, adapt to get through this moment. You know what I mean? If you don't do that, you're just sitting there like, man, I'll get through it. God's going to take care of me. Seriously? Yeah. God's looking at you like, uh, I can, but you got to like help out here. You know, you got to like do something. And so what the way that God helped me was he put the inspiration in my heart and in my mind as to what it was that I needed to do to get through this moment. But this moment is not just this moment. This is like the evolution of where we're going to be going with this. So this period of chaos is not chaos and it's not temporary. This is like an evolution of stuff that we're doing because the inspiration that God provided me was other ideas and concepts that some I already had, but now they're being put in place and they're evolving, they're growing, they're expanding. But on the same token, he also put other ideas in my mind. You know what? This would be a good concept. Okay. So let's start working on it. But we didn't, we can't work on everything at once. We got to like work a little bit at a time, perfect those areas, and then continue to expand. That was the thing. So in this middle of chaos, we have some massive opportunity, not to mention that now with my team in place, Things are starting to like get crazy awesome, you know, including this platform that you guys are watching, this podcasting situation, which just so you guys know, at the time, I had no clue what a podcast even was. I knew I wanted to do one because it was a great way for me to teach, inspire, and entertain. And also during this period, this was what I could do, you know, there was more time on my hands, which we're going to get to in a little while about, about having time. So, you know, it, it, it's either it's either you grow, you expand, or you fail, or you fall apart. It, it's a choice. You have to make those decisions. You can't just sit there and pray, God, please help me. Let me get through it. And then sit on the couch and watch TV. You know, if you do, which happens to me, yes, it does happen, which is what happened with me. It's exactly that. I would get inspired. Hmm, that's an interesting concept. But then you got to do something with it. You can't just say, well, you know, God will take care of me. Doesn't make sense. You have to take those ideas. That's God providing them. That's God saying, I got you. But if you don't do anything with it, he's looking down like, oh, I'm, I'm helping you here. I'm, I'm giving you what, I, what you need to do. Now do it. You know, this is a 50 50 job. This is not, uh, you can't put it all on my shoulders. Sometimes, yeah, he's going to take care of things on his own, even if you mess things up. But in this kind of case, you have to move forward. Like if I'm not sitting here in front of you talking and he inspired me to do this, but I'm not getting microphones, doing this on a weekly basis, hiring a team that could do the, the, the editing and the, and the graphics and all this, the marketing and all that kind of good stuff, then what point was it? You know what I mean? He gave you the seed. He gave you the seed. Now plant it, water it, and watch it grow. You got to work. You got to get in there. You know what I'm saying? You can't just sit back and just do the same shit because in this environment, you continue to do the same shit. You're going to get the same shit. It's just a merda. No difference. So, you know, the, you can take these opportunities to fail. Or you could take these opportunities to grow and improve. It's up to you. You know, these are difficult times and these difficult times will either make you or break you or create you make you, break you, or create you. And in our personal case, me and my team, this is creating us. This is a vision that I had. And without them, this wouldn't happen. Without God, this wouldn't happen. And to be blunt, this whole pandemic, it probably wouldn't have happened because there's always excuses. You know, well, you know, I, mean, I can't do it. I'm not sure. It's not the right time. I'm too busy. You know what I'm saying? It's bullshit. It's bullshit. There's always opportunities. So, you know, when it comes to like the dog situation, you know, a lot of times when we try, when, when, when we get a dog and um, we get a dog, that's, that's, that's a challenge. Like for me, socks, where is he? No, he, used to, he was down here. He actually probably laid down somewhere else, but um, dogs come into our lives to improve us. Now Caesar Milan has a saying that we don't get the dog we want. We get the dog we need. Socks was the dog I needed. Just like we talked about a bunch of times that without him, I wouldn't be here right now. Okay. I would still be wearing a suit and tie, bello, bello, nice, nice, miserable as hell, okay, without him. So we get the dog we want. I'm sorry, we don't get the dog we need. We get the dog we want, which is basically the philosophy of faith and patience, which we don't get what we want. We get what we need, but we also get it at the right time. 
right? And in the right way. And not necessarily the way that we see ourselves getting or the way we want to get things. It's just whatever, you know, that's where the faith comes in and the patience to wait. But when it comes to like dog situations, people will get a dog and they have experience with dogs their whole lives. Maybe they've had the same breed their whole lives, whatever the case may be. But what ends up happening is that they get the dog that's now challenging them, that's challenging their knowledge because they have gotten the dogs before that were easy. You know, they've gotten the dogs that really never gave them any problem. They got the peanuts of the world, right? The ones that, you know, you didn't have to do anything and they got lucky. And some people get lucky that they get the easy K, the easy dogs and they don't have to do anything. But then all of a sudden you get the one dog that's saying, you know what? I want to test your knowledge. I want to see what you got. I want to see what you're all about. And now you have to do something about it. So a dog that um, a difficult dog that comes into our lives forces us to get more knowledge. It forces us, he forces us or she forces us to grow in knowledge, grow and expand our education. You know, I always say we get a PhD in dog, you know, because you only know so much. This dog is pushing you to learn more because, you know, he's saying you don't know enough. You know, and it's either dog knowledge or personal knowledge. So it help they help us improve to become better dog owners as well, right? So they 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 improve us as people because we have to work on our calmness, we got to work on our assertiveness, we have to work on our leadership skills, we have to work on our own emotional state, our own mental state, our own spiritual state to be better dog owners, right? Without that challenging dog, without that dog dog, without that socks, we don't get challenged. So we don't improve, we don't grow, you know? So out of the chaos, we have an opportunity to grow as human beings. Not to mention that that helps us grow as dog owners, but it also helps us grow our knowledge of dog. Now, what does that do? It makes us better dog owners. That's what it does. We understand more dogs. We cater to them because these dogs are saying, you got to learn more. You don't know enough. If you want me, you want me to be happy, you got to learn. Go to Canine U or Pac Man U. Ooh, Pac Man University. Mm, interesting. We should discuss that. Pac Man University. The Pac Man University. We should have a little theme song for that. Anyway, all right. I'm, I'm going out of the way. So let's stay on track here. I think that, see, see, out of chaos comes we get opportunities. I'm thinking about more ideas. See, this is God saying, hey, we, we I got more stuff in store for you, buddy boy. That's exactly what's happening here. But, um, what I was saying was they help us grow as dog owners. They help us improve as dog owners. And what I always feel and what I say to people a lot of times, especially people that are fosters, they, they, um, they foster for rescues or they, they like to adopt or whatever the case may be. And they constantly have like, like a lot of dogs in their lives by increasing and learning more, you become your own rehabilitation center. What the hell does that mean? There's tons of fosters out there. Unfortunately, most fosters um, don't really know anything, right? So now you bring a dog into your home, and because you're applying the love, 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 and reward, 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 and got your sweet score, the a sit, the sit, the sit, a stay, a stay, a stay, a stay, all that bullshit, they creates troubled dogs. Or if you have a troubled dog already, you bring them into a household that doesn't really know what to do, and from a foster standpoint. That does that dog does not improve. So now is that does that dog become more or less uh, is that dog more or less able to be adopted? It's less able because the trouble is still there. Now, if we take a foster and we further their knowledge or we just take a normal person and now we further their knowledge. And now because of the fact that they had this dog before who forced them to further their knowledge, to grow, to improve, they become better fosters, meaning they become their own rehabilitation center. So now they could take a troubled dog from a rescue because they know what to do because they've done it already. Guess what? They could rehabilitate that dog. So what's more valuable? You know what I mean? I'm one person. Imagine if we have everybody that's doing the same things. If we're all doing the same things, if we're all doing the right things, we could grow dogs the right way, raise dogs the right way as, as puppies, or if we get troubled dogs, we apply the same principles. Guess what? We're fixing those behaviors. Now we could adopt them out. I mean, how much more valuable does that make you as a dog lover? You know, you're a dog lover. You want to foster dogs. God bless your heart. 
but how much more valuable are you in the dog community when now you know, when you understand how to communicate dog language, when you know and understand dog psychology and you apply that to a troubled rescue who has a difficult time, you know, getting adopted and you're fixing and rehabilitating those issues, here you go. You give them to an adopter, hopefully they'll, you know, learn and do the right things as well. And now we're helping the dog community. Does this make sense? You know, that's, that's my, that's my purpose in this, in this world, in this life is to be able to educate as many humans as possible. Because like I said, one person can only do so much, but if now we start to expand and we start to give the same knowledge that I possess to somebody else, now that person can do the same thing. So the more dogs come into each home, the more they could do. You know, and so that's kind of like a vision that I always have. But in the middle of this, this, this situation, let's not, um, let's not disregard the fact that troubled dogs are why we, we are here. They were sent to us for a reason. The troubled dogs were sent to us to grow our knowledge, to become better dog, to become the better dog owners or proper and better dog lovers. You know, so it's up to us to see it as an opportunity or to see it as a problem. And you could bitch and moan and complain about it all you want. At the end of the day, it's, it's up to you. You know, when it came to socks and socks came into my life, I saw it as a disaster. I saw it as a curse. You know, I didn't know just how valuable he was going to be for me and just how much he was going to give me and how much he was going to, you know, he was going to, he was going to teach me. And he was out of a chaos. He was freaking chaos. And that's why I say to my clients when they complain about it, you know, this, you know, this dog is driving me crazy in my life and this and that out of chaos comes great opportunity. It's up to you to decide. Is it an opportunity or is it chaos? It's up to you. This environment has taught me exactly that um, in the middle of this from a business perspective and from a personal perspective where people are being depressed and they're, you know, falling apart and they can't do this and they can't do that and their businesses and all that kind of stuff you know what, this is the opportunity, you know, you could take this as an opportunity to grow, or you don't, it's up to you, you know, at the end of the day, it becomes that. And it's also a timing issue. There's a it's about time. So you know, which is another thing that I wanted to get get into, which is discussing the whole, you know, we I don't have any in, enough time situation. It's a it's, it's an excuse that I really don't like the whole, you know, I don't have time. I tell people all this always, you have to put in the time to work with your dog, not necessarily just from like a walking perspective or exercise. It's not just one thing. There's a lot of other stuff that you can do that you must do, but you have to do this kind of stuff. Meaning you need to put time in it throughout your day to work on certain areas. So it's not just about, I have to take my dog out for a walk. No, if you want to teach your dog to not do certain things, not counter surf, not jump on the couch, not jump on people, not bark when the doorbell rings, whatever the case may be, you want to section off some time when you could practice those specific exercises, those specific topics, those specific, whatever you want to call them. Okay. That takes time. Does it take a lot of time? It depends on how you look at it. You know? So the excuse I always hear is, oh, I don't got enough time. I can't, I don't, I don't have time. Okay. I also hear these excuses when it comes to like personal situations, you know? I want to go back to school, but I don't have enough time. I want to, you know, do this, but I don't have enough time. In the middle of this pandemic, we all, all of us had a lot of time. Okay. For the most part, all of us, we should have, we could have used that opportunity of having time to, I don't know, learn a new skill, finish a project. Um, I don't know, accomplish something do something that we wanted to do that we couldn't do because we didn't have enough time. Now, there's some people that in their business world will say exactly that. Well, I would like to, you know, expand and, you know, add something or whatever the case may be, but I don't have enough time to do that. And I'm not going to say that I wasn't guilty of that because I probably was. I don't really remember, but I'm sure I was as well. Perfection is, is, you know, I'm not perfect and I'll, I'll be the first to admit it, you know, and I'm learning as I go along and I'm growing as I go along. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, my personal experiences help at least one person out there in, in, in some area. But in the middle of this pandemic, especially before when, you know, when there was a lot of like not being able to do stuff, we had a lot of time on our hands, on our hands. And me personally, 
I did not wallow for too long because like I said, I was inspired. So now it was time to get moving. So I really was not sitting around twiddling my thumbs. I wish I was, but on nice, a nice nice glass of wine or beer or whatever. Um, but, you know, was busy putting in place the pieces that God has said, okay, now we have to do this stuff. And that's why I have no time is not an excuse. Okay. At that point, there was plenty of time. So now beforehand, when I didn't have the time to do these projects, to start this podcast, to start some of our virtual, our virtual programs, start some of the other projects that we have in place, now I had the time. So now what's the excuse? The excuse is on me. Now it's my fault. So if I don't get off my ass, if I don't, if I don't get up and start moving, it's, it's on me. I'm going to regret that and have to live with that or complain about it. Well, you know, this country and, and the business and, and this world and, and always make excuses for shit when the real excuses are right here. You know, it was my fault. And um, during this pandemic, if like I said, if you didn't come out with a skill, with an accomplishment, with, with doing something to move forward, to grow, then it was never a time issue. It was a lazy issue. It was a you issue, you know? And that doesn't mean that, that you can't start that at any point. You know, you can start at any point. It's just that you have to recognize, okay, if this is something that you want to do, get it done. It doesn't mean that you have to like take tackle a bunch of stuff together. That's a mistake, you know, and I'm very guilty of that because I tackle a bunch of stuff and I want to get them all done. And I confusione, me confundo. And me personally, when I get overwhelmed and I get too frustrated, I tend to just stop altogether and not want to do anything anymore because it's just too overwhelming, you know? And you know, it's, it's hard when, when, when you're trying to do something, but you feel like you have all this weight on you and it's crushing you, you get demoralized. You don't want to do any more of it. So you tackle one thing at a time, you know, maybe a couple of projects at a time, you still have your list of stuff that you want to do, but let's focus on getting this stuff up and running. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be up and running this way. Okay. This is kind of like starting. Let's start this now too. You know, so this way it's not too much on top of you because then you kind of make, again, excuses. Well, I don't have enough time because I have all this shit going on. Fine. Take care of this first, then take care of this. But you can't wait so long because this shit is going to be up and running soon. If it's not, then it's not a time issue. It's you're not doing it right. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's, it's dedication. It's commitment. This pandemic has taught me that we all have time whether it's time to spend with our families, whether it's time, obviously, you know, circumstances, we can't do that right now, but whatever the case may be, there's always time to do stuff. The question is, what do we prioritize? You know what I mean? So we prioritize stupid shit and we're fiddling around playing with our phones and playing these stupid games with the beep, and filling out these stupid questionnaires on Facebook about, you know, what would I be if I would be a, 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 I don't know, a shoe, what kind of shoe would I be? And you're spending 10, 15 minutes filling out a questionnaire. Why don't you take that 10 or 15 minutes and teach your dog how to, I don't know, not jump on the couch. You know what I'm saying? Why don't you take that 10 minutes of you watching your little Netflix, uh, you know, soap opera shit and, you know, take some time that 30 minutes and spend time with your loved ones or with your dog, you know, take them for a walk. You know, there's been a lot of people that have adopted dogs during this pandemic. And my concern is that when life goes back to normal, shit, let's pray to God. Let's hope that doesn't happen, but we'll see, you know, because now I have more time. I could dedicate it to the dog. What happens when you go back to normal life? Then you're not going to have time for your dog anymore. Then what's going to happen? You know, so time is not the issue. You're the issue. You need to make time to do certain things, but don't overdo it. You know, when I tell my clients that they have to work on certain things, the one thing I always tell them is don't overdo it. Carve out 10 or 15 minutes, two, three times a day, one time a day, whatever, whatever you can do, just start the ball rolling because you can't do too much too soon. It's just going to be too overwhelming. You know, if you're not used to it, don't do too much. Just do a little bit, just do a little bit at a time. So if your goal is for example, is to add um, a different a different service to your business. Or if your goal is to teach your dog 
to do a trick, or if your goal is to teach your dog to stop doing a certain behavior, or if your goal is to lose some weight or whatever the case may be, you have to carve out some time to focus on that. And you look at your entire day and yeah, some, sometimes, you know, days are tough, you know, there's, you have a lot of stuff to do, but is it all related to one topic? Like, again, for me personally, the business world, yeah, it's, 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 it's a whole day thing. And there's personal stuff that you got to do. You know, you got to do the laundry, you got to cook, you got to do food shopping, you got to take the dogs out. You know, there's all this stuff that you got to do throughout the day, but let's prioritize a little bit. You know, don't forget to also carve out some time for yourself. You know, just 10 minutes, five minutes, whatever, give yourself a break, you know, and time is precious. Don't waste it on stupid shit. Don't waste it on stuff that ultimately does not matter. You know what I mean? Waste it on certain things that don't matter to a certain extent, but prioritize that at the bottom of the list. You know, time is precious. Time doesn't last forever. So when it comes to your dogs, give them some time. When it comes to your family, give them some time. When it comes to your business, give them some time. But again, everything is about balance. You got to learn to balance your life. You know, we're all struggling with that, me included. You know, how do you balance life? How do you get every piece together? And it's a, it's, it's a juggling act. Some days are better than others. Some weeks are better than others. Some months are better than others, you know? But if you start to, if you start to get stressed out, it becomes a problem. You know, this job, when I stopped being a financial advisor and I started doing this, I haven't worked since. But at some point, this became a job and wasn't fun anymore. It stopped being fun because now it's a job. And so I had to revert back to the old days when it wasn't a job. And now we're back to having fun. Yeah, dance around and you have fun. I'm by myself right now. I'm acting like a clown. Well, I mean, the dogs are somewhere. I mean, they're probably going to be like, what the hell's wrong with that fella? Daddy's a little crazy there. But you know what? It's all good because now we're back to having fun because I understand that out of chaos came some amazing opportunity for growth. Not just business growth, personal growth. You know, in the middle of situations, you know, you, you learn who you really are and you become who you want to be if you make the right decisions. You know, if you do, if you think about it, right, if you, if you approach it the right situation, if you approach it the right way, you know, also from a time perspective, you learn how to manage your time. You learn how to balance life. And that's, that's really the key. That's really what's, what's all about. You know what I mean? So, you know, have fun with stuff, enjoy life, enjoy your dogs, enjoy them, treat them like what they are. Don't treat them like humans, you know, treat them like what they are. Give them what they need. Learn what they need. If you don't know what that is, you know, don't make it about you, make it about them and not just dogs your whole life, whether it's your staff members, whether it's your family, whether it's whatever it is and make time for you. You are important. You know, you're the driving force to all this stuff, but you got to have the right mindset out of chaos comes great opportunity or out of chaos. You bury yourself. Depends how you look at it. Do you not have enough time? Or do you have enough time? You just haven't been managing it or using it the right way. Which one is it? Only you can decide. Okay. Any questions, any problems, let me know. Guys, thank you for watching Barking for Balance. Hope you learned something. Catch you next time. Peace out.